तो हेलो एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग जस्ट कंफर्म इफ आई एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टू ऑल ऑफ यू जस्ट राइट इट इन द कमेंट सेक्शन इफ आई एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टू ऑल ऑफ यू सो इट इज जस्ट अ रिचुअल वी हैव टू फॉलो विद दीज टू लाइंस वी बिगेन आर एवरी सेशन जस्ट कंफर्म इन द कमेंट सेक्शन इफ आई एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टू एवरी एंड देन विल स्टार्ट आर सेशन ओके थैंक यू रेड ऑन थैंक यू मनीषा ओके तो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वुड लाइक टू कंग्रेचुलेट ऑल ऑफ यू यू मस्ट हैव नोन बाय नाउ दैट विद इन फ्यू मिनट्स आर चंद्रयान विल बी लैंडिंग ऑन टू द ल्यूनर सर्फिस तो ग्रेट कंग्रेचुलेशन टू ऑल ऑफ यू टू ऑल द ग्रेट माइंड टू ऑल द साइंटिस्ट विच हैव वर्क डेडिकेटेडली एंड फोकस्ड फॉर दिस फॉर अचीविंग दिस फीट विच मेनी ऑफ द ग्रेट नेशन हैव नॉट बीन have not been able to do so far right so pay your tribute pay your blessings to all those scientists right and by learning from those scientists because they were so dedicated we have to be more focused more dedicated towards our today's daily news simplified session right so just be focused all the topics which we are going to discuss were displayed on the thumbnail without wasting much time we'll start with our first topic right so our first topic is taken from the indian express explains section and the topic reads the resisting landslides so as from the heading it is very clear this topic deals basically with the landslides and as far as the syllabus is concerned upsc has mapped this particular topic in the general studies mains paper 3 section in the subsection of disaster management right the immediate context in which this news article has appeared in today's newspaper is the recent landslides in the states of himachal pradesh as well as uttarakhand because of high intensity rainfall so this topic becomes very important as it has been written explicitly in general studies mains paper 3 also if we go by the previous year question paper analysis every year two questions are asked from disaster management in gs3 more specifically landslide has been asked in 2021 as well as 2016 so this repetition tendency proves the fact that this topic is very important right just have a brief look on both of these questions in 2021 the question asked you to differentiate the causes of landslides in two regions that is himalayas and western ghats similarly in 2016 the question was asked to identify that what are the important causes of landslides in the himalayan region and suggesting the measures to tackle with this issue so these questions tell you one important aspect that is whenever we are dealing with the disaster management or we are dealing with any geographical phenomena as such or the disaster we should understand that what are the key parameters what are the key forces which are operating in different regions differently that is how you can answer differentiate the causes of landslides in western ghats and himalayas so in today's session we will be dealing with all these aspects what are various causes of disaster uh, of uh, landslides what are the various ways through which we can manage them first of all we'll begin what do we understand by landslides so in a very basic conceptual definition we can say that landslides is basically a type of mass movement right we all know these mass movements are of two types rapid and slow on the basis of the speed landslides are the rapid mass movements correct the basic definition this will be more understood with the help of this diagram so this is just a rough diagram the landslides are basically the rapid mass movements what are mass movements in a very layman language mass movements is from any slope if the mass of rocks or debris or certain rock particles if they are coming down that slope it is known as the mass movement right that is why mass movement is defined as the detachment that is detachment of this thing which has to come down detachment and the downward movement of those particles on this slope now the first question we should come to your mind is 
वट आर दोर्सेज विच अफेक्ट दिस मास मूवमेंट और पर्टिकुलरली लैंड स्लाइड राइट द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इज द ग्रेविटी लेट एस अंडरस्टैंड दिस डायग्राम तो सपोज दिस वॉज ए माउंटेन एंड एट दिस पर्टिकुलर लोकेशन वेदरिंग एंड इरोजन वॉज बींग डन बिकॉज ऑफ सेवरल इरोजनल एजेंट फॉर एग्जाम्पल एयर वॉटर ग्लेशियर्स एक्सेट्रा बिकॉज ऑफ दिस एक्शन दैट इज वेदरिंग एंड इरोजन दिस पॉइंट कंटिन्यूसली गॉट इरोडेड एंड एज अ रिजल्ट दिस स्ट्रक्चर वॉज फॉर्म्ड राइट एज सुन एज दिस स्ट्रक्चर वॉज फॉर्म नाउ बिकॉज हेयर वी आर हैविंग ओवर हैंग ऑन विच द ग्रेविटेशनल फोर्स विल एक्ट वेरी इंटेंसिवली अ पॉइंट विल कम वेन दिस पार्ट विल ब्रोक फ्रॉम दिस पॉइंट एंड इट विल कम डाउन दैट इज हाउ द लैंड स्लाइड विल अकर तो द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज दैट इज ग्रेविटी द सोल फोर्स अंडर विच लैंड स्लाइड और द मास मूवमेंट टेक प्लेस और अदर फैक्टर्स ऑल्सो प्ले देर रोल राइट तो द कॉन्सेप्ट इज ऑल द मास मूवमेंट्स मूव अंडर द सोल इन्फ्लुएंस ऑफ ग्रेविटी हाउ एवर अदर फैक्टर्स लाइक दीज इरोजनल एजेंट्स लाइक वॉटर ग्लेशियर एयर एक्सेट्रा दे डू प्ले देर रोल इन एनहांसिंग द मास मूवमेंट्स दे एड द मास मूवमेंट्स राइट तो टिल नाउ द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ लैंड स्लाइड एंड द मास मूवमेंट इज क्लियर नाउ दिस इज द मैप which shows the most vulnerable regions in india because of landslides and by using our common sense also we can identify those regions okay western himalayas as well as the eastern himalayas whole northeastern region is the second one and the western ghats and that is why upsc asked the question to compare the causes of landslide between which two regions himalayas and western ghats correct so that is how we will proceed with this first we will look that what are the various factors or causes which are operating in himalayas and leading to landslide now here one important thing is there are certain common factors general causes of landslides which will be operating in every region right but when we have to compare different regions differently so there will be few factors which will be more dominant in a particular region compared to the other region for example this tectonic activity so this tectonic activity is more dominant in himalayas not in western ghats right so peninsular block is relatively much more rigid and stable there is no tectonic activity and hence tectonic activity will not be a dominant factor but when we will discuss himalayas so tectonic activity will be the dominant factor so that is how you have to approach how that is how you have to analyze various regions okay as far as the himalayas are concerned we all know that the indian plate is moving towards the eurasian plate which in turn has led to the creation of this sachar zone which we call indo sankho sachar zone this is an example of continent continent convergence right both plates are continental in nature because of this continuous intense intensive convergence we experience high intensity earthquakes also in these regions now just imagine if any suppose this is the ground and if this ground is being shaken so don't you think that rock particles will weaken themselves right for example this is a rock and these are various particles in this rock so the sharing the bonding strength between these particles will get weakened because of the continuous shaking earthquakes and tectonic activity once these rock particles get weak and their strength get reduced so obviously the landslides will increase right come to the second point that is the nature of rocks again we know when we have to talk about himalayas himalayas are predominantly sedimentary rocks why these are sedimentary rocks because they were formed out of crumbling and buckling of the sediments which were present in the tethys sea so the plates collided it buckled down and those sedimentation because of those sediments we find the sedimentary rocks in the himalayas we also know that sedimentary rocks are relatively weaker for example if you have to compare sedimentary with igneous rocks which rocks are weaker sedimentary rocks are weaker if sedimentary rocks by nature are weaker then obviously they will experience more landslides 
more detachment of particles, more downward movement of particles, right? So they are weak. These sedimentary rocks also have pores, they have higher porosity, they have higher permeability also. So that is why because of higher permeability and porosity, the water percolates into these rocks, further weakening these rocks, right? Also, there are many cracks and fractures which are developed in these sedimentary rocks, making this Himalayan region more vulnerable to landslides. Come to the third factor, steeper slopes. So, just use your common sense. If suppose there are two mountains, one is like this, other is like this. This is the ground surface, right? So, what do you think? On which part of the mountain, on this slope or on this slope, there will be more landslides? This one, why? Because here the slope is steeper, gravity is acting much more. That is why steeper. So we know that Western Himalayas have very high steep slopes, right? Then come to the glacial melts. Again, glaciers are the unique feature of the Himalayas, not the Western Ghats. So because of the glacier melt, again, it is an erosional agent. We just discussed in the previous slide that how erosional and weathering factors aid the mass movements. So, this is going to increase the intensity of these mass movements that is landslides, right? Next factor is the anthropogenic factors. We all know that because of the creation of roadways, rails, various dams, that is the infrastructure, resorts, hotels, etc. are being created on these fragile areas. And this creation of infrastructure has created a lot of overlying pressure on these rock systems, which can destabilize the rocks and destabilization of the rocks further can lead to landslides, right? So these are the dominant factors which are operating in the Western Himalaya section. Similarly, now compare this with the Northeastern region. So here, for the simplification, I have taken the Himalayan part as well as the other northeastern hills in a one section. Okay, so when we talk about the northeastern region of India, which are the most important factors here? Here also tectonic and geological factors will remain same. That is the nature of rocks because this is the range of Himalaya. So obviously tectonic activity is taking place in this region also. Sedimentary nature of rocks are found in this region also. So these factors will remain same. But more dominant factor in this particular region is the high intensity rainfall because of the southwest branch of the Indian monsoon. So here we find one important region which is one of the most wettest places of the earth. Which are those places? In Meghalaya, we have Cherapunji, we have Mosindram. Garo Khasi Jentia Hills, right? So, because the southwest monsoon is obstructed by this region in 90 degree, that is perpendicular, and that is because of which there are high intensity rainfall in this particular region. Again, rainfall is an agent which will aid the mass movement. So, this factor is more dominantly operating in the northeastern region, right? Then comes the cloud burst. Again, because of the higher convectional rates, because of the higher orographic upliftment, faster condensation, we find cloud bursts also in these regions, further aiding the landslides and increasing the intensity of this disaster in the northeastern region, right? Flash and burn agriculture, again a unique practice, predominantly we find it in the northeast region, we find it in other areas of India also, but predominantly in northeast region. So, because here we are experiencing this flash and burn agriculture, therefore it is leading to deforestation. So, if we are, let's say, if this is the rock and these were the trees, so if we are removing these trees, we are actually removing the roots also, which earlier were binding the particles here. So, if we have removed these trees, Again, that binding, that strength has reduced. Again, weakening this particular soil or rock, again leading to the landslides. Also, this particular region, especially because we know that Meghalayan Plateau is the extension of what? Peninsular Plateau. 
वी नो दैट पेनिसुलर प्लेटो जियोलॉजिकली इज रिच इन मिनरल डिपॉजिट हिंस दिस एरिया ऑल्सो हैज रिसोर्स to extract those natural resources a lot of mining takes place in these regions you must be aware about this term rat hole mining right so write it in the comment section what do you know about rat hole mining right so because of higher mining activities in these regions again the rocks of these areas get weakened and hence they increase the frequency as well as intensity of the landslides so these are the factors which are predominantly operating in north eastern region now come to the third region that is the western ghats okay again i would say that many of the factors are common the only thing is that how you prioritize your points in your main answer so when we talk about the landslide in western ghats the first and the most important point is the orographic rainfall because again western ghats experience one of the wettest are the one of the wettest areas in india the south western monsoon branch again obstructed by perpendicular western ghats leading to orographic upliftment right that is the upliftment of wind because of the presence of mountains oros mountains right so this is the first factor second these regions also experience very high illegal mining similar to the northeastern region because again the peninsular part uh, peninsular part right dam mismanagement now this is important factor per se for the western ghats because just few years back there were kerala floods and there many many reports have suggested that because of the poor management of dams because of the sudden release of the water has led to those floods so we know that water or floods can aid the mass movements if you are increasing the volume of river which is flowing through the rocks so their erosive capacity will increase if the erosive capacity is increasing it will mean that the rocks will start breaking up hence may lead to the landslides right deforestation and the infrastructure plus tourism activities they are also very rampant when it comes to the western ghats right so these are the factors which we can write which you can understand also and if you combine all those factors it will become the factors or the general causes for landslides in various regions across india right so this next slide basically summarizes all the discussion which we have done for all the regions so i would request you whosoever want to wants to take the screenshot of this slide they can take it will help you to have small brief notes about the causes factors responsible for landslides for all these regions right take the screenshots now we have till now understood that what do we understand by landslide what is its concept and what are the factors responsible for it we understand that landslides are disasters which create a lot uh, lots of losses in terms of lives and property so if it is a disaster we need to manage the disaster that is what our syllabus says disaster management so to manage the disaster we have a national landslide risk management strategy okay first of all before going to the components of this strategy just using the basic knowledge basic common sense just think that what things should be taken in mind in consideration if you have to manage any disaster okay for example first thing is that you should understand the nature of disaster right that what type of disaster are we dealing with if you understand what are the factor responsible for that disaster only then you can take certain steps as a remedy so first is the nature of disasters second comes the regions which are most vulnerable to those particular disasters that is how you can map that this particular region is more vulnerable to floods this region is more vulnerable to droughts this region is more vulnerable to landslides this is what is known as the zonation that you have to make several zones initially we this we saw that what are three most important and vulnerable zones landslide that is himalayas northeast and the western ghats so this is zonation once you have uh, once you have identified that which are those zones which are those areas which are vulnerable to particular disasters next thing is that you need to develop the early warning system 
grade, right? So what is this early warning system? Early warning system basically will provide the information, will disseminate the information to all the relevant stakeholders that is district administration, state governments, central governments, community, panchayats, etc. All the important stakeholders, they will disseminate or communicate the information that at this particular time, this disaster might hit your area. Hence, you should take certain precautionary steps. Right? So, you need to develop early warning system. If this system is saying that you need to take precautionary steps, what should be those steps? So, for to identify those steps or to educate about those steps, there should be a continuous awareness program. Okay, just go step by step, you yourself will be able to manage all the disasters. So, there should be awareness program for the community, right? Then there should be continuous research and development because we know that present times we are not witnessing any one disaster in a particular region. We witness series of disasters, the cascading effect of disasters. For example, in one region, we experienced high intensity rainfall, right? Suppose this was, this was the region, high intensity rainfall, which in turn led to floods, which may in turn breach the dam right which may in turn lead to landslides so you can see that how multiple disasters are linked to each other that is why a continuous research and development must go on continuous improvement in this early warning system continuous improvement in data collection must go on in the context of any disasters so these will be certain general steps right now let us see that what are various components of national landslide risk management strategy. First is the landslide hazard map, that is the zonation. Then comes development of landslide monitoring and early warning system discussed. Then comes the awareness programs done. Capacity building and training of the stakeholders. Preparation of the mountain zones, regulations and policies that is taking certain legislative measures. For example, certain areas, in certain areas, there will be prohibition on mining, right? There can be certain areas which are ecologically fragile and hence roads cannot be constructed. Those regions might not be open for the tourism. If it has to be open, if certain activities have to be taken place, then there should be certain regulation. For example, we all know about the environmental impact assessment. What is this? This is basically a regulatory policy, right? And then stabilization and mitigation of the landslides, constructing certain structures so that if the landslides occur, those debris can be blocked on the mountains. So many a times if you have traveled hill stations along the roads, you might have witnessed certain iron bars which are inserted into the mountains, into the rocks, right? There are certain grills which are placed along the roads onto the mountain so that if there is a fall of debris, it might not come onto the roads. So, these are certain measures. Okay. Clear? All these steps, again, you can take a screenshot of these NDMA guidelines for landslides. Basically, this is an explanation of the things which we have discussed. For example, landslide monitoring and forecasting, research and development, response mechanisms, capacity development, awareness, etc. This is basically a fodder material. So again, you can take the screenshot. I'm out of the screen. Take the screenshot, those who want to, and put it in your notes. Okay? Yeah. So this is regarding the landslides. Okay. So just a one minute session for the doubts, if you have any with this particular topic. Okay. Just go ahead, just ask the doubts. So, I will be waiting for your questions. If you have any question related to landslides, write it in the comment section. I will address them. If not, then we will move ahead, okay, with the second topic, okay. Feel free to ask. Uh, 
ओके नोट्स विल बी प्रोवाइडेड टू एवरी वन ओके नोट्स आर अपलोडेड ऑन टेलीग्राम चैनल ऑल्सो इट इज देयर अवेलेबल ऑन दी आई एस कंपल्स वेबसाइट ऑल्सो राइट ओके सो विल मूविंग अहेड टू दी नेक्स्ट टॉपिक राइट नेक्स्ट टॉपिक दिस टॉपिक इज टेकन फ्रॉम दी द हिंदू डेटेड ट्वेंटी थर्ड डेली एडिशन फ्रॉम द टेक्स्ट एंड द कॉन्टेक्स्ट पेज एंड द टॉपिक रीड्स एज यू कैन सी ऑन प्रोटेक्टिंग द बायोडाइवर्सिटी ऑफ द नॉर्थ ईस्ट अगेन इफ यू हैव टू मैप इट इट कम्स अंडर जनरल स्टडीज मेन्स पेपर थ्री स्पेसिफिकली मैंशनिंग बायोडाइवर्सिटी एज इट्स इंपॉर्टेंट कॉम्पोनेंट ऑल्सो एनवायरमेंट वी ऑल नो दिस राइट context in which this article has appeared because recently the meghalaya high court in a public interest litigation regarding the umiam lake this lake is in meghalaya itself has said that the natural beauty of the state should not be destroyed so in this context of this particular pil this article has appeared so in today's session what we are going to do we will understand that we will understand the biodiversity specifically of the northeastern india right first and the foremost thing is understanding the concept of biodiversity what is biodiversity what do we understand by biodiversity again in a very simple language biodiversity will be flora and fauna of a particular region okay so more the variations in the flora and fauna of a particular region we will say that more diverse that particular region is right so what do you think that what will be those factors which will be increasing the diversity of a region for example let's say climate is the one factor so if any particular region we are experiencing a lot of climatic diversity we can say that there will be more number of more types of natural vegetation for example in northeast we experienced tropical climate hence we have tropical vegetation we also experience temperate or the alpine climate in the high reaches again the we have the natural alpine natural vegetation we have subtropical climate also corresponding natural vegetation also right so just think about all those factors which will increase the diversity in that region so first question is that why north eastern india specifically has so much of biodiversity right so let us see some of these factors first is the geological evolution if any region has experienced a long term of geological evolution with the help of tectonic instability with the help of various geological processes so that means that that region has experienced a much diverse phenomena right so there was a point when india was in the gondwana land right it moved from the gondwana towards the angara land so this movement also led to the shifts in the climatic zones geological evolution various geological phenomena took place so because of this higher geological evolution northeastern region also has higher diversity but is this the only factor no there are other factors also right for example we have discussed diverse climate so northeastern region has tropical conditions subtropical conditions as well as the temperate or the alpine conditions so again higher diversity in climate more diversity in flora and fauna then comes the topographic diversity now because in the northeastern region we have mountains we have plateaus we have valleys we have flood plains we have so much of topographic diversity that it again leads to the increase in the biodiversity aspect of that particular region because the species which you will find in the higher reaches of mountains will be different from the species which you will find in the river valleys right so the species which you might find in the brahmaputra river in assam will obviously differ from the species in the higher reaches of sikkim correct so that is the topographic role of topographic diversity then 
comes the soil diversity more diverse this soil is more its effect will be on the diversity of veggie natural vegetation forest right microbial life okay so because in those areas we have alluvial soil we have laterite soil we have mountainous soils hence more diversity this is an important point <coughs> relative isolation right and this is very much true for the northeastern india even if you go by the historical traces historical things also this northeastern india has remained relatively isolated from the mainland india so this has led to one important significance that its natural biodiversity of the northeastern india has remained preserved for relatively much longer time compared to the other parts of india so that is how isolation has preserved its natural biodiversity next is the culture in northeastern india we know that many tribes live so tribal culture more or less is relatively more in harmony with the natural environment so right so tribal culture is more in harmony and hence again the preservation of the existing biodiversity of that particular area so these are the points that why our northeastern india has so much of biodiversity second important dimension is why should we protect it that is all about the today's article why we are talking so much on biodiversity and conserving the wildlife and all these things there are two important reasons one because of their inherent benefits their inherent significances second because they are facing threats also that is why we need to conserve them we need to protect them okay when we have to talk about threats in northeastern india we experience huge number of natural disasters like floods landslides earthquakes etc forest fires so all these natural disasters also have detrimental impacts on the biodiversity of that particular region then not just the natural factors humans are no less because of the increased in the human interference because of creating infrastructure tourism activities all these things slash and burn agriculture poaching also all these things again is increasing the threats levels of the biodiversity again third very important point is the transboundary nature so when we talk about the northeastern india right so when we talk about the northeastern india we are sharing international borders with china with myanmar with bangladesh and here nepal bhutan also right so when we talk about northeastern india there are so much of international borders we are sharing and obviously animal does not recognize the international or political boundary so if the animal is in myanmar he that animal might move to india also and vice versa that is why for biodiversity conservation for their preservation for their protection we need international cooperation which becomes difficult right so this is also one of the reasons difficult cooperation with these countries right smuggling international smuggling and poaching takes place in this particular region right so these are certain important threats related to the biodiversity in the northeast then comes the significance now how can you think if you have to write it in your main answer what points are you going to write that how the biodiversity is significant to us what is its importance very simple idea is just follow the concept of ecological services the services which are rendered by any ecosystem to us okay so because biodiversity is in that particular ecosystem so the services will be rendered to us by the biodiversity also okay for example if we take about the provisioning services let's say wood so yes trees biodiversity will provide us wood similarly food so yes any fishes will be taken as a food material right similarly regulating services for example climate regulation pollination water purification etc 
Then comes the cultural services. Many trees, many animals are revered by those tribal communities. They have huge significance when it comes to their social cultural practices, their religious beliefs, etc. Supporting services, their role, for example, role of microbes in the soil formation. Right? So these that is the reasons that why we should protect the biodiversity. Okay. Next is that what are the steps taken in this regard to conserve the biodiversity because it is so much of importance. So what steps have been taken? One, government has followed a protected area approach. Now what is this protected area approach? So in a particular region, there can be pockets which are relatively more biodiverse which we can isolate from the other areas okay so that is why we will mark one particular area and we will frame certain new laws certain string more stringent laws through which the human activities in these areas will be governed for example we create national parks wildlife sanctuaries biosphere reserves etc this is basically the protected area approach we know in northeast we have several national parks we have manas we have nameri we have debru shikova right so all these national parks kaziranga also very important so all these national parks etc this is basically the protected area approach right second is the biodiversity action plans which are prepared by center and state both to preserve these areas Okay, then we have certain legislative as well as policy measures. For example, we all are aware about Wildlife Protection Act. Recently, Wildlife Protection Act has been amended also. So, with Wildlife Protection Act, Forest Rights Act, Environmental Impact Assessment, such policies, we try to regulate basically the human interferences in these activities. Right? But obviously, we cannot stop or prohibit the human activities altogether because we have to follow the concept of sustainable development where the benefits for humans have to be taken into consideration but up to certain extent beyond that no because we have to protect our biodiversity also right then comes the international agreements as well as india's commitment for example we are signatory we have ratified the convention on biological diversity United Nations Framework for Convention for Climate Change, then we have Paris Agreement. All these things, basically what we are trying to do, we are trying to tackle climate change, we are trying to conserve or preserve our biodiversity, all these things are interrelated, right? Community-based engagements, again, several steps have been taken by the government in order to engage the community and more especially, two sections one are the tribals second is the women so in various government plans these tribals and women government try to engage these two sections more importantly when it comes to the biodiversity conservation and that is where the role of district councils also comes into play that is the local organs right so these are the various dimensions which are associated with the biodiversity in Northeast. Again, you can take the screenshot. Again, I'm out of the screen because some of you have requested the screenshot. So just you can take it and you can. Okay. Yeah. So now moving ahead. Right. If you see these two particular images, you will see this image basically shows color codification it is basically it shows the diversity of the natural vegetation this might not be visible to you so i am telling you what it is written in this section it has been written that there are evergreen forests there are subtropical broadleaf forests mountain wet temperate vegetation himalayan moist temperate subalpine semi evergreen moist deciduous Basically, I am just trying to prove the fact that there is a lot of biodiversity when it comes to the natural vegetation in the Northeast India. Why? Because of the climatic diversity and all those diverse factors which we discussed, right? 
also we are aware about the concept of biodiversity hotspots when we talk about the northeastern india so here there is an overlapping of two biodiversity hotspots this particular region lies in the himalayan hotspot right this particular region lies in the section of indo burma hotspot right so again this shows the richness in the biodiversity of the northeastern india again this topic is complete whatever you doubts if you have you can just write it in the comment section okay i'll address all those doubts and then we'll move to the next part so i am i am just waiting for the questions <clears throat> yeah anyone just ask the questions and then we will move ahead right <clears throat> raghuvendra singh rajput the global events impact the regional biodiversity so for example if you are asking about any particular global event let's say there is a build up of a corridor which is traversing across several countries let's say a road is starting for example bri or any that road which is starting let's say from china and crossing through russia entering into europe so don't you think that this particular thing is going to impact the biodiversity across all this region right similarly another global event can be for example certain global conferences so this was a study which was there in the hindu article and it was very good and this was ironical also when there are international conferences which are objected towards conserving the biodiversity so how do various signatories various ambassadors reach any particular country they use aeroplanes and there are high emissions from the aeroplanes so basically there is a global conference which is taking place in a particular region to protect the environment to tackle climate change but the people who are coming to there are themselves contributing to the climate change by various emissions right that is one of the reasons which were uh, during covid times it was said that all these global conferences must go online so that at least we can follow this the theme of climate change protection in latter and spirit that is how various global events can impact the regional biodiversity right okay so next topic <coughs> this topic is mainly from the prelims point of view the prelims section right the topic is taken from the indian express section and the topic is in relation to the india and china and the continuous conflict across this particular region if you go by the immediate context the immediate context says that there has been bilateral meetings on the highest levels also because brics summit is there where india and china both are the important partners so because of these various possibilities and modalities of the limited disengagement have to be discussed right basically the india china conflict in that particular region if you go by the prelim syllabus this can be put in the current events of national and international importance so this we are dealing with the help of this this is a map work basically every year there are questions which are asked from the map sections right so just we shall be restricting to certain important places in this particular region if you say this if you see this particular image there is a very important plateau known as the dollar big old plateau this db plateau is somewhat here okay there are two other important locations one is the darbuk one is the shok to connect the darbuk and shok there was a road that is darbuk shok dob road because of which again there were certain issues between india and china till they exist 
राइट सो दिस इज दी डरबुक शोक रोड बेसिकली दिस रोड वॉज कंस्ट्रक्टेड इन ऑर्डर टू लिंक और कनेक्ट ले डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ लद्दाख टू दी काराकोरम पास नाउ दिस इज दी काराकोरम पास इन दिस काराकोरम रेंज so this is the karakoram pass lay was to be connected to the karakoram pass and hence this road was constructed here lies the galwan region this is the aksai chin area which is basically illegally occupied by china this particular line is the line of actual control here we also have one important feature that is pangong so pangong lake okay when it comes to the ladakh region there are two very important rivers here one is the indus we know this and obviously second is the shok so here lies river indus here lies the river shok okay so these are certain important features from this map which can be asked in the prelim section this is for a very brief topic just the prelim pointers you just need to know that Uh, which areas are located at which place in this particular region okay coming to the next topic again from the prelims pointer again this topic is very important from the world map section so that was from the indian map this is from the world map section this topic says that inflation pressures may linger but food prices to ease soon says ministry so from the headline this topic is from the economy section but when you see the context that in which context this article this news item has appeared that is from the international relations sections because there has been a termination this is the context of the black sea great initiative so some of you must be remembering that what was actually the black sea grain initiative so basically we all know that there was Ukraine Russia war right Ukraine and Russia are one of the most dominant exporters when it comes to wheat sunflower as well as other grains okay so because there was a war going on between UK uh, between Ukraine I'm sorry between Ukraine and Russia because of this war there were disruptions in the supply chain because of the disruptions in the supply chain this this grain was not being exported to other countries because of which the prices got inflated of grain in almost every major country across all the continents to tackle this particular issue united nations basically entered into the agreement with ukraine as well as russia in order to supply in order to restore the continuous supply of the grain now because if you see the map this is basically ukraine and this is russia and black sea is the is bordering ukraine as well as russia so whatever material has to be exported from these countries is must travel from the black sea only right so that is why this initiative was named as the black sea initiative united nations said that whatever ships will enter whichever ships will enter into the black sea for the purpose of taking the grains and supplying them to different parts all those ships must be used only for the peaceful purposes for the humanitarian causes this was the black sea initiative in this context from the plims section again we should be aware about certain key facts related to the black sea okay first is the bordering countries so total six countries border the black sea this is the map which shows clearly which are those countries starting from ukraine russia turkey then we have greece then we have bulgaria and then we have romania important point is here we have a country that is moldova so moldova is not bordering the black sea because this is the border of moldova okay so this is basically landlocked when it comes in the context of the black sea so these are six countries which border so this was related to the political features around the black sea 
we should also look at the physical features around the Black Sea. First, the important rivers which enter into the Black Sea. Most of the rivers starting with D, not all, most. For example, Danube, Dniester, Dniper, Don. So many a times it has also been pronounced as Niper, Nyster, etc. DL silent. Doesn't matter. You just have to go in the prelims and you have to read. You don't have to orate. So Danube, Nyster, Niper, and Don. Other rivers are Southern Bug, important, right? And Kuban. So these are certain important rivers draining into the Black Sea. Next comes the important straits of the Black Sea. So said there are three important straits in relation to the Black Sea. First is the most important one, Strait of Bosporus. What is a strait? Strait is basically a narrow water lane which separates two major water areas. For example, this is the narrow water lane separating this, connecting this Black Sea with the Sea of Marmara. Bifurcating the landward part of this portion. So, Strait of Bosporus connects what? Black Sea and Sea of Marmara. Then comes to this map. Here we are having another strait that is Strait of Dardanelles. This connects Sea of Marmara. This is the portion of Sea of Marmara and the Aegean Sea, certain marginal seas, right? Last is the important again Strait of Kerch. This Strait of Dardanelles is also known as Strait of Gallipoli. It has the historical significance. So, if you know, write it in the comment section. Right? Last is the Strait of Kerch, which connects Azov Sea and the Black Sea. Again, you can take the screenshots of these important traits as well as the rivers entering into Black Sea. Again, I am out of the screen. So, just take the screenshot and collect it as your notes. Right? These are certain facts which we have already discussed. Okay, we have discussed that which strait connects which two water bodies. So, that is all for today. Right? If you have any doubts, again you can ask. The session is going to end. These were the important current affairs from today's newspaper. You are free to ask any doubts. Just a small error from my side. George. Georgia is basically the bordering country. Okay. And not this one. So, thank you, Manisha, for writing in the comment section. Okay. Yeah. Any other doubt? Okay, so thank you. We are ending this session. All the very best and study hard.